Okay, if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew 5. We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' actual teaching. Our Lord, so ministry that he begins here. Last week, we looked, I gave you some of the intro, introduction to the Beatitudes. We're going to look into, let's get into uh, the weeds a little bit, okay? In, in a little bit of more detail. Matthew 5, verses 3 uh, to 12. 3, three through, through 12. This is God's word. Blessed, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is God's word. So, um, you know, as he begins to teach, um, what they notice, the crowd, what they notice is this. That in Matthew 7, 28, says this. When Jesus had finished saying these things, chapters 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount, right? So when he had spoken, finished spoke, uh, having uh, taught and spoke the Sermon on the Mount, the preaching, people were just amazed, okay? And this is what they say, said. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Now, what he means here, what the Pharisees or the people who were listening, especially the educated, uh, the priest, what they were thinking is, you know, when you write paper, as you get older, you write term papers and... Um, in fact, I think a Harvard uh, president was accused of plagiarism, okay? And she, had, uh, she was terminated. Plagiarizing is when you take someone else's work and don't give credit. So when you, when you write a paper and you have footnotes, and in that footnote you cite other people's work, right? Whether it be in quotation or you got the reference from so-and-so, you know, he wrote it, she wrote it. You have to give credit to that person, okay? Otherwise, you're accused of stealing, which is plagiarizing which is another form of saying just stealing. When he spoke, he didn't refer to any Pharisees or teachers or any, um, some renowned person. He spoke out of his own authority. And the way he spoke convicted people, people that were hearing his message. Okay? It was like a knife penetrating to the heart, bringing conviction. Okay? No one spoke like he did. Right? It's kind of like watching a great athlete right now. You know, I'm watching a lot of football. You know, great ones make it look easy. Right? Great ones make it look easy. You think you can do it until you try it. Okay? That's what makes them great. They make it look easy, effortless. Right? Whether it be writing, whether you're an artist, a musician, it doesn't matter what. Whatever field you're in, if you're good at what you do or become great at what you do and you stand out, you become unique, then people take notice. Do they not? Right? You pay to see that person perform. Yeah, I will pay to see that kind of thing. Right? I mean, this is the way God, when he spoke to us in the person of his son, aid of the Holy Spirit, there were some who were converted at that moment. Right? They broke down and accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Where others, they just, they just fell asleep. You know, it didn't register. All right? Now, with that said, I want us to, I want you guys to kind of visualize two kingdoms. Okay? Not equal, but two kingdoms. Two realms, if you will. Okay? One is the kingdom of God, and the other is the kingdom of Satan. Darkness, the devil. Right? He has a realm. 
he has certain power and influence the way he tried to tempt Jesus before he began his ministry when he was in the desert, right? He says, I have a kingdom that was given to me that I can give it to whoever I want. People actually sell themselves out to the devil to make money, to gain status, to gain power. People actually do this, okay? I'm not going to get into detail, but people sell themselves out. They sell their soul, all right? So there are kingdoms. There are two kingdoms. One is the kingdom of light, kingdom of God, and the other is kingdom of darkness, kingdom of Satan, the devil, okay? In order to get into God's kingdom, begins here in verse 3. Blessed, happy are the poor in spirit. Hmm? This doesn't mean you're poor financially, necessarily, that you are poverty stricken. It means you are poor in terms of character, attitude, your outlook. You are humble, which is unnatural to us because we are by nature proud, stubborn, right? You don't want people telling you what to do, especially as you get older, all right? So to, to be humble is counterintuitive, doesn't come naturally to me, right? Last week we talked about how we can play the game. You can play the game of being modest and, you know, and sort of humble and whatnot, but you're not genuinely being humble. You're just kind of like conforming to your atmosphere at that moment. Right? Kind of sharing the credit or taking the blame and people applaud you for that. But you're not actually truly, genuinely a humble person. Now, what makes us humble is that I need to realize that I am unworthy before God. I don't deserve to get into this kingdom, the kingdom of God. I don't deserve it. I am unworthy. In other words, I need to realize, right, through knowledge of God's word and, in, and spending time with God by way of relationship, knowing God by way of uh, experience, that I am really, really a bankrupt, wretched, vile individual. Society will not say that, especially in a Western culture, that you're not, you're okay, you're decent, you're a good person, right? Psychologically that, you know, oh, we need to kind of manage and, you know, uh, massage your, your fragile self-esteem. You know, you need to have good self-esteem and self-worth of, of who you are in order to be able to navigate through this world, you know? You, you can't look down on yourself and be critical and, and, and you know, um, be meek, like the kind of verses that we're going to look at. You know, this is so unnatural to me. No, you need to be confident. You need to be self-assertive. You need to, you know, like be a go-getter, you know, be kind of proud, right? Um, independent, ambitious, so you can kind of brag, if you will. Certainly other people brag about you, of all your accomplishments, the school you went to, the job that you acquired, the degrees that you've earned. Right? This is all really self-aggrandizing. This is, you're blowing your own trumpet. Right? And this is what the world applauds. Wow, great. You're awesome. And we gravitate to that. How could we not, naturally speaking? Right? I don't want to see myself as this poor in spirit, you know, this, this humble nobody. Who wants that? You know, the world's going to reject you, right? Your friends are going to reject you. You loser. Okay? And yet, when I begin to understand what God is saying is that, blessed, happy are you when you adopt these attitudes because you are now in the kingdom of God. You are no longer in the realm or the kingdom of Satan and darkness. We don't constantly throughout life compete and bite each other and stab each other in the back and get over each other and step on somebody so I can get ahead. I, I need to put you down so I can get ahead. Right? I need to make you small so I can be big. This is like doggy dog world, right? Isn't it? Right? And so what God is saying to us is when, when you come into my kingdom and you begin to know me and you have a relationship with me, the fact that you have this utter 
a realization of knowing who you are as a person in the scheme of God's plan and design, then knowing God, I know who I am. Remember, in order to know who I am, I need to know God first. In knowing who he is, then I can begin to understand how I interact with the world and the relationships that I want to develop in this world with the people that I engage with. Right? And this is really the work of God, right? It's not, it's, I'm, I'm putting a distance. I'm not saying you can't be, hear me correctly. I'm not saying you can't be ambitious, that you can't, you should work hard, and, and that you should try to acquire. These are all important things. That, yeah, you must and you should. But they're not my ultimate. Get it? It's not going to make or break me if I don't get it, if I don't have it. And yet to many of us, if I'm so absorbed and encompassed, and obsessed with it, then it will break me if I lose it, or someone threatens it, or is taken away from me. Right? Because my whole personhood, my being, and my identity, my values are wrapped up in that, whatever that is. Whoever that person may be. Okay? And so knowing God, knowing in, 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 in the presence of God and knowing who God is, that I am in I am broke. I am bankrupt, right? I have no currency to negotiate with God. I bring nothing to the table. I offer nothing. I am nothing, if you will. And I want God to build me up. I bring him nothing but my sins. And that is the priority of the Christian. For the Christian, I am poor in spirit because there's a part of me, if you're a Christian, there's a part of me, part of me that I want to kill and yet it lives. And I will only be perfected when I die and go to heaven, right? That I will struggle with my repeated sins that I cannot seem to shed. There's a part of me that I keep repeating, that I cannot shake loose of. It, it has a hold of me. This is why in some of Apostle Paul's letters, he, he puts it in two very distinct categories. Either you are a slave to righteousness, God, or you're a slave to sin, one or the other. There's no neutrality. There's no Switzerland of third party innocence. Either you were one or the other. You belong to God or you belong to Satan. Even as a Christian, even though I am in the kingdom, I struggle because of my residual remaining sins. Right? I struggle with this. This is why I am poor in spirit, because I am sensitive and mindful of my own shortcomings. I am sensitive and mindful of how holy God is and how I am not. And that makes me poor in spirit. When you compare yourself as human beings, when you compare yourself to somebody who's greater than you, better than you, right? Don't you feel kind of inadequate? At the very least, you keep your mouth shut. Huh? In the presence of greatness, I become small. In the presence of greatness, I stand up, I move. Right? In an Asian culture, usually when the parent, when the dad comes home especially, everybody gets up. Not in my house, but I don't know about your house. You understand that? So imagine that in that principle, in the presence of God, in the presence of God, I realize just how utterly inadequate and bankrupt I am. There's no pride there. There's no ego. There's no self-confidence. Certainly there's no self-righteousness. Oh, yeah, but, you know, but me, yeah, but, yeah, but there, there's none of that. Lord, I am bankrupt and broken. I'm contrite in spirit. Proverbs 16.5 says, the Lord uses a very strong word, detest the proud. Detest the proud. He says, certainly for surely they will not go unpunished. The se seven... Deadlies, if you will, in Proverbs 6. Read it. What's the first one? Pride. Is pride, I'm going to give you some examples now, okay? So perk up. Is pride that drove Satan out of the paradise. He wanted to be like God. I want to be number one. I don't want to be number two. Pride. He saw in himself, wow, look how beautiful I am. Look how wonderful I am. Look how amazing I am. I want to take the place of God. Pride generated that rebellion. He got thrown out of heaven. Right? Pride can kill you. 
you understand that? Pride can kill you. If not, leave you destitute and lonely. Lonely. By your lonesome. What, are you going to hug your pride? You're going to look in the mirror and kiss your pride? You will be miserable. Okay? Mark my word. You will be miserable if you hold on to your pride. So in, in essence, I am a beggar before God, right? I'm a beggar before God. I'm just, as a Christian, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where to find the bread of life. I think one of the <clears throat> traps that pastors, people like me fall into is that, you know, especially in certain denominations, you have to be well-educated. You gotta go to seminary, you gotta have your master's, you gotta have your doctorate, certain degrees, and, and, and that, that kind of uh, makes the pastor proud, in a sense. In this country, especially before the Civil War in 1860, the pastor was the most educated person in town. The two, at least two, of the Ivy Leagues in this country were, well, actually, Ivy Leagues all began at seminary school. Okay, if you didn't know that, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, they were all seminary schools. And, and Jonathan Edwards, probably the greatest American theologian, was the president of Princeton. Men who were uh, the head of advanced education in this country when it was founded were pastors, some of them, the most educated. And that can go to your head. People start calling you doctor this and doctor that. Right? You become proud. How could you not? Because that, that impulse is reinforced by society. So happiness in this sense is, what I begin to understand is, is happiness is inside out, not outside in. Happiness is inside out, not outside in. In other words, I'm not... My happiness isn't determined by ex external circumstances. Remember I told you about the stockbroker, this lady who made money and lost money? I could just see it on her face on a Friday night. When she made money, she was happy. When she didn't, she was sad. Completely dictated and enslaved to her circumstances, out, outside external circumstances. And that's who we are, especially at your age. I can't escape that. And look how old I am, right? Many things mold and shape us by our outside external circumstances. Mood swings, if you will. Up and down, ebb and flow. Right? When things go well, externally I'm happy. If not, then I'm sad. You understand? This, these characteristics that I just read to you here, beginning with poor in spirit, is internal. It's on the inside. That is impervious to the external circumstances. Wouldn't that be great if I can live like that? I am untouchable in that sense, if I can live like that. Huh? Completely stable, right? Secure, safe, immune, if you will, to the outside external forces that shape me. Blessed, happy, or the poor in spirit. Now, this word blessed also has the opposite. Opposite, which is woe, W-O-E, cursed, cursed are you. The way Jesus cursed the Pharisees in Matthew 24, the seven woes, cursed are you. On the outside, you're shiny, you're bright, the, like the white sepulcher, which is speaking of the, the tombstone, if you will. But on the inside, you're a dead man's bone. There's worms and maggots growing inside you, Right? Because my heart and my desire, my motive and my incentive and all the things that I consider to be ultimate relies and, is, and resides here on this world, this kingdom that is governed by, influenced by Satan. Okay? So if I belong into the kingdom of God, God would have us be content and happy, if you will. And that begins with being poor in spirit. So he can pour, P-O-U-R, so he can pour, if you will, his spirit into my P-O-O-R spirit. Right? I am full. I become full 
when I am when I am connected to God. Everything in this world, trust me when I tell you this, okay? We talked about Solomon. All the pleasures and happiness and, and th- things that we enjoy here is temporary. Temporary. Get it? Even later, I hope you get married and, you know, you stay married forever until, you know, you, one or both of you die. But even that is temporary, isn't it? Hmm? 50, maybe 60 years of marriage at most. Right? Even a good thing like that is temporary. Right? So all the pleasures in this world, all the accolades, all the praises, a lot of it is empty praise of men. All of that is temporary. Temporary. It's not permanent. I want the permanent. God would have us want the permanent. Isn't that so much better? 70, 80, 80 years of, I don't know, maybe you'll have a charming life, fulfilled life. Great. Still temporary. God would give us that which is permanent, <clears throat> that will not rot, that will not be taken away, that can't be stolen, that is pure, that is right, that is good, and that is everlasting. Okay? If I want that, and you should want that, especially if you're a Christian, I need to be poor in spirit. I want to be poor in spirit. So I can have the, the treasures that are truly lasting and worthy. Right? This is why the discipleship, if you will, when you read the, the Gospels, is seemingly contradictory. Lose your life, what? In order to find your life. Huh? Lose your life in order to find it. Forget about what you want. Forget about me, 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 what I want. Give that up, surrender it, submit it to God, and then he will give you the true life. He may give back some of your ambitions and goals, but he may not. And I find contentment in that. All right? Let me give you an example with Apostle Paul. You talk about a cool guy, okay? He says, I know what it's like. I have learned. 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 Okay? Behavior lesson, if you will. How to be a base and how to abound. I know what it is to be in want. And I know what it's like to have plenty. In any and every circumstances, I learn how to be content. In any and every circumstances. And I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It doesn't matter if I'm in in scarcity or I have surplus. Imagine that attitude for a second. Right? You are just steady as you go. You gotta be the coolest cat in that room. Nothing can phase you. Nothing can disturb your peace. You'll never get bent out of shape. You'll never be disturbed. You are just steady rock. I know what it's like to be in want. I know what it's like to have plenty. Right? Because he's so connected to God, he's anchored, his soul is anchored to the permanent, to the eternal. Everything else fluctuates, temporary. Here today, gone tomorrow, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, right? Theirs is the kingdom of God. You will receive and dwell in God's kingdom. I was just re- uh, listening to Revelation 21 this morning before I came to church, and it describes this new heaven, this, this, this new city that God brings, whose architect and designer is God himself. It is beyond description. That's what awaits me, the Christian. Okay? That's what awaits the Christian. I belong in God's kingdom. And everything that's his The cattle on a thousand hills says God is mine. Right? That, I am a joint heir, co-heir with Christ when I'm united to God. That's what awaits me. It's like you're finding out, you know, um, you had a rich uncle you never knew. And he left you like $10 million in his will. Uncle who? 
right? All of a sudden, you get this great news. You get a call from a lawyer. You know, I mean, the, holy, the guy says, hey, you know what? You had this uncle so-and-so. You need to come to the hearing, and he left you $10 million. Wow. My whole attitude changes, does it not? When I'm anticipating and when I gain, when, I, when that which is by faith becomes more real to me, that, that kingdom of God and the riches of heaven and glory and everything else awaits me as a child of God. Imagine knowing that, having that, right? Then who really cares what happens on this, on this daily grind of life, up and down, all around? You know, it doesn't really bother me, Right? Like this, this, my value isn't tied to this temporary world. I don't know if you guys know who Jacqueline Onassis was. She was the wife of Jacqueline uh, Kennedy, Mrs. Kennedy, President Kennedy. And one of the things that the, <clears throat> the media and the public relations people, especially New York City, Madison Avenue, they were intrigued by her. And one of the reasons why they were intrigued by her, it wasn't so much because she was beautiful, although she was. When she came out in the public square and people were taking pictures, throwing a mic at her face for, you know, word of, you know, what her opinions were, she had this look, they said. This look that she was looking beyond the immediate, beyond the here and now. There was something about her that she was looking beyond. Now, I don't know if she's a person of faith or not, but that intrigued a lot of people. Okay? So whether that interview was going well or whether people were taking pictures of her because they admired her or not or whatever the circumstances were, she had this presence about which she would gaze beyond, but kind of like over the horizon, this look about her. And that left the people kind of puzzled. What? I wonder what she's thinking, right? What is she, what is she thinking about? What is she, I wonder what's going through her head right now. She wasn't completely absorbed in her present situation. I'm not saying that you should be absent-minded, right? That you shouldn't be present. But there was a part of her. I'm using that as an example for the Christian. There is a stronger and growing part of me that, yeah, I may enjoy this world, the things that are, when it's good, it's good, it's great, Right? Remember I shared some, would share with some of you, right? You know, my Joel gets rich and buys me a Porsche because he felt generous. <laughs> I'll enjoy it. But if I don't have it, I don't have it. I'm not going to cry over it. You get it? There is this part of me. All right? here's, a, here's a big SAT word. Insouciance. What that means is you are detached and cool. Cool towards the things of this world. There's a healthy distance. Hmm? That there's a growing part of who, you're, who you are as a makeup, as a character, as a person, that look beyond the horizon. Okay? That your heart truly is not embracing the things of this world. That you belong to another. You belong to someone else. Blessed are the poor. In spirit, they shall see, for theirs is the kingdom of God, right? Now, lastly, I was going to, okay, maybe we'll do one more. In Genesis, you have this wonderful story of Joseph, right? Jacob had 12 sons with four different women, and his two sons, Joseph and uh, his kid brother, Benjamin, were his favorites, okay? Because Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, uh, he loved her, and, and she gave him two sons before she died, giving birth to Benjamin. Now, in that storyline, you have famine in the land of Canaan, where Jacob lived. And his brothers, he, he, he told his brothers to go to Egypt and get some food, right? Otherwise, they'll starve to death. Read the story, Genesis 33 and on. Great, great story. And... Fast forward, Joseph is in Egypt. He was sold by his brothers, right? He becomes his prime minister, second in command. And <clears throat> all the world is coming to Egypt to buy grain. And Egypt becomes wealthy and wealthier and wealthier. The middle kingdom, if you will, right? 
And finally, uh, Jacob hears the news that his son is alive. He thought his son was dead, Joseph. And Jacob says, I will go and see my son. I will go down to Egypt and see my son before I die. He goes, meets his son. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, greets Joseph's father. Because Joseph is a great man in Egypt. Without him, everyone would have starved, including Egypt. And so when Jacob meets Pharaoh, Jacob is destitute almost, if you will, right? Poor in every sense. Now get this. It is Jacob who blesses Pharaoh. You would think it would be Pharaoh blessing Jacob, at least condescending to Jacob. It is Jacob who blesses Pharaoh. Why? Why? Because Jacob is the spiritual superior, spiritually superior to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a pagan, if you will. He is materially wealthy, rich, materially status, rank, all the accolades of the world, all the treasures and the values of the world. Yeah, Pharaoh. Jacob, because of who he is, descendant of God, promise of God, the promised child of God, he is the one that is superior and more wealthy, if you will, has the true wealth before Pharaoh. He blesses Pharaoh. How does this Pharaoh, this pagan person, understand and appreciate that to a certain degree? How? Because of his son, Joseph. Jacob's son, Joseph. Because without Joseph's insight and revelation that God gave him, the dreams that Pharaoh had, he could not interpret. He didn't know what it meant. And Joseph interpreted that correctly, and it happened. Seven years of famine, seven years of plenty. Skinny cows, fat cows, and all that. Fascinating story. Joseph, because of his insight and 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 understanding because of his commitment and and union with God gains that revelation understood it it's the spirit that matters not the physical it's the spirit that saves not the physical book of James book of James brother of Jesus he tells the rich be humble be careful because you are in a lower status than those who have faith because you can't purchase faith with money faith is a gift from God no matter how much money you have you will never be so insulated and secure in your world that you find true peace because a lot of wealthy people are anxious insecure oh my god how can I keep what I have What if someone steals it? You become a target. It's the rich, that book of James, James tells that, that don't be arrogant, don't be proud, because what you have, no matter how much wealth you have, is temporary. It'll be taken from you one day. You can't take it with you, another. When you're dead, you're dead. Back to the dust you go. Naked I came, naked I go. Right? That's why I don't understand Christians who are hoarders. You know what a hoarder is? They don't throw out anything. Their rooms, their closets, their garage is filthy. Stuff that they accumulated like 30 years of their whole, their whole life. They can't throw anything out. Well, you're stingy and cheap as a Christian. Right? Oh, no, no, no. It's me first, me only. Most people, I dare say, I mean, I've, I've been walking on this earth for 60 years. I say most people are takers, not givers. I had a kid way back when, Sunday school, when I was like 25, I think. He was maybe nine. And the church was handing out these, um, these candy chocolate bars or whatever. And every, all the kids wanted it. They were actually fighting for it. And this kid, Arno, I still remember this, 40 years ago. Nobody wanted to share and I wasn't expecting anything. I just said, hey, Arnold, can I have one? Without hesitation. I think that's something that you just either have or you don't. 
right? Either you're a taker or you're a giver. And most people are takers. Chaplains in my office, men, men that are as old as I am, takers, not givers. Blessed are the poor, because my kingdom, in my kingdom, in my God, I have treasures and, and riches that awaits me. That's why I hold loosely, you understand? I hold loosely with things on this earth. It's not going to make or break me. If I have it, great, I'll enjoy it. If not, I don't. Pull, want or plenty, either or, doesn't matter. I can do all things through Christ. That's his connection. That's the truth. That's the, that's the authentic reality for the Christian. Doesn't that make sense if you think about it? Why do I hold on to things that are temporary? It's like holding on to water. Right? Why do I do that? Why am I obsessing over things that are perishable? That will rot and rust? Or I... I in academia or scientists, you know how they, you know you know how jealous they get, how they compete for what, you know against each other because they get envious and jealous because oh you know you like you received accolades and recognition and I didn't. They steal from each other information and knowledge and you know research and all of that. It's sad. Grown ups become little kids. Why? Why do, why do we do that? It's not just insecurity. It's not just because we're greedy. Selfish, self-centered. It's all of that. But there's an emptiness. There's, a, there's an emptiness that I can't fill. Because I, don't, I can't see beyond this world. For the Christian, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For the non-Christian, this is it. This is all you get. Nothing more, nothing else. How sad, isn't it? That you've got to fight and steal and, get, and become ugly and compete and, and kill and bite each other and put people down so you can get ahead. That's how the world lives. That's how the world operates. That's the custom and the tradition of the world, is it not? You better get yours, get it now, get it quick. Right? There's no mercy. Hmm? And what? Be poor? Be, be, be humble? Be modest? What are you on, drugs? How do I operate in a world like this, like that? Hmm? They'll chew me up and spit me out. It's the security. I wanted to do one more, but I, I won't. It's the security in knowing God, right? It's the security in knowing God that makes me rich. And people equate this with relationships, non-Christians, okay? If I have you, right? Thousand and one love songs, right? Remember that movie Gladiator? No, 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 Troy, right? With uh, Brad Pitt, right? The face that launched the thousand ships, the Trojan War, Helen of Troy. Men kill for women or for love. That's really the, the, the height, if you will, the lure, the attraction of this world. Love, right? Money. Take your pick. Love or money or both. Some people choose money over love. Really. Okay? But love, you would think, yeah, that, that, would, that would fill me. That, that, that would complete me. One of the cheesy songs, you complete me. <laughs> right? you're, my, you're my other half. All kinds of ballads and songs that came out motivated by love. Okay, good, get it. I hope you have it one day. But that's not all, is it? If you think about Solomon, if you read your Bible, if you, if you look at what God is saying to us, who have more love and accolades and status and power, material acquisition, possession, every, anything and everything you can think of, endowment, then Solomon. And you know what he said, okay? Vanity, vanity, all this vanity, meaningless, meaningless. What did I do this for? Okay? It, it would be sad if, if and when you become as old, right, or older, and say, like, you reach my age, and you look back, and you have this misgivings, regret. I've done nothing. 
with my life in terms of meaning. Remember, I shared this with you a long time ago, especially when you come to Christ at an older age, which is harder, right? Like your parents' age, my age, your grandparents' age. People who come to Christ late in their life, one of the tremendous regret and guilt is when they look back in their life, they say, I've done nothing for him. I've done nothing for God. I'm just getting in by the skin of my teeth, literally. By the sheer mercy of God, I'm getting into heaven. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Right? But why? Why should you do that at your age? Because your whole life is ahead of you. Mine is behind me. Yours is ahead of you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Look at the promise. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what awaits the Christian. Blessed are the poor, not the self-righteous, not the religious, not the proud, not the personally ambitious, not the self-confident, not the ones who feel worthy. But those before God understands the poverty of their spirit, the bankruptcy of who they are, the unworthiness of who they are, the humility that is genuine, that is humble. These are the ones that God adores, favors detesting, opposing those that are proud. We hate people that are proud, do we not? People that are conceited. Let's pray.